Greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is Ana Chiarita Lavatelli. I'm the Associate Director of Digital Media at the MCA Chicago, the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago. And um, I'm simply chairing the session, keeping an eye on the clock, and letting you know some important news that um, if you're here for Chad Weinard's presentation, he's not here. He's out with the flu. Um, so this is good because we have more time for these other presentations. We're going to start off uh, with Victoria from Blue Cadet, who uh, is going to present with um, two uh, collaborators, I guess I should say. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to let her introduce them since she worked so closely with them. Great. Thank you, Anna. Um, as she said, my name is Victoria Jones, and I am a senior producer at Blue Cadet, which is an interactive agency in Philadelphia. Uh, my co-presenters today are Marla Shoemaker, who's the Senior Curator of Education at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and um, Kate Quinn, who is the Director of Exhibitions and Public Programs at the Penn Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology, um, also in Philadelphia. Um, so our session is about um, ways to get institutional support, buy-in, ways to encourage funding, um, getting donors on board, um, and so we're just going to sort of start out talking about some of the tools and strategies that you can use. Um, and then Kate is going to be talking a little bit about long term, how you can create this uh, buy-in over time. And then Marla is going to go into a specific example. Um, so uh, some of the strategies that you can use, um, and I'll be kind of going from sort of beginning stages of a, an exhibition into more concrete phases. Um, so from the outset, you'll want to identify the opportunities that uh, media is uniquely suited for. What can it give to your project um, where it's inherently a good part of the story, inherently um, the best way to tell whatever it is um, that you're talking about. And so as an example, um, we do a lot of sort of discrete strategy phases with museums where we're uh, working with them as they're just figuring out the concepts for the exhibition. Um, and determining, you know, what are those golden opportunities? What do those look like? Um, so for the Museum of the American Revolution, we identified these seven, um, including elevating the museum's collection, personalizing the visitor's experience, creating a sense of place, connecting to the people, um, memorializing the experience, visualizing the revolution, and setting the tone. Um, and so one example of something we suggested taking off of um, elevating the museum's collection was they actually have really, really great um, high resolution photography of many of their objects. And so just taking those and um, just really zooming in on, on specific details and projecting that really large. Um, and so this is a new museum that's being built right now in Philadelphia and this idea is actually going to be um, carried out in the, uh, the new interactives that are being created. Um, so after you've identified the opportunities, you can kind of take it to the next level and write out um, compelling story-driven written treatments that really kind of start to detail out what this could look like for the visitor um, and really start to give people an idea of what they're going to be getting. It's very easy to kind of just in an abstract way say, okay, you know, funding's been cut, we're going to cut back from 20 interactives to 10. But if you actually kind of start to get a personal understanding of what each of these is going to be and what it can give to you, um, you start to think, oh, well, that experience, that would actually be really valuable. Maybe there's somewhere else that we can um, make a change. Um, and so to further that, you can also then mock up visuals of the treatments, which, again, makes it a little more concrete, gives you a little better idea of what it would be like. Um, and then really importantly, mocking up the visuals with visitors actually using those um, interactives or viewing the media. Um, because it really gives you a sense of what that experience is exactly going to be like, and especially a sense of scale, um, which just isn't present in a, you know, a written treatment or even just a, a visual treatment by itself. Um, another thing you can do is actually do formative evaluation. Uh, Marla is going to be talking about this a little bit later, but also you can do um, tap testing of the mockups you created, which is um, Literally, you just print out all the screens that you've mocked up, and you present them to people and ask them to touch uh, where they would touch, you know, if it was a touch screen, or click if, the, if it was a computer-based interactive. Um, and then you just switch out the, the pages, and then you can sort of see how successful your design is, um, even at a very rudimentary stage. Um, and then the final thing I just want to talk about is finding creative ways to maximize your budget. 
Um, and so this is an example from uh, the Penn Museum project, uh, Native American Voices, which um, Kate will be talking about a little bit more as well. Um, but in this example, there's actually four of these very large um, media towers, which have a lot of impact and presence, but we were able to um, really find ways to get this impact on a low budget because the bottom screens are all touch screens, but then the top screens, which you can't reach anyway, are all just regular screens. So finding ways to um, create a lot of impact, a lot of presence, um, but without uh, spending a lot of money. And now I'll turn it over to um, Kate Quinn. Good morning, everyone. Um, can you hear me? OK. My name is Kate Quinn. I'm the director of exhibitions and public programs at, wait for it, the University of Pennsylvania Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. <laughs> we call ourselves the Penn Museum for short, and it is the title of the institution that we're working towards. But right now, we still have the long title. Um, so thank you, Victoria, for inviting me to be here today. I'm really excited to present to you all. Um, Victoria had come to me with the idea of presenting um, a simple notion, how do you get your media funded, um, <coughs> which is very tricky, as you all know. Um, so taking a look at my history within my institution, I've been at the museum for seven years. Um, I built into it over the course of seven years. Um, so I'm going to walk through a bit of that process. We just came out of an exhibition, Native American Voices, that Victoria just spoke about, um, which was the most ambitious media project the museum has ever undertaken. So in order to help you understand how we got there, I'm going to take you back in time a bit. So the museum, the University of Pennsylvania Museum, was founded in 1877. It's a very old institution. It's, in fact, the largest university museum in all of North America. We have over 1.3 million objects in our collection. Um, it's a university museum, obviously, connected to the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and I was hired in 2008 to come in and to really help the museum and its staff to stop thinking of themselves as an institution that was by researchers for researchers and instead take a look at how to take our research and our collections and be more outward focused and look at the public and create visitor-centric exhibitions. We have had, in the course of our history, over 500 active expeditions. Every year, we still go on about 50 or so exhibitions. expeditions. Um, so we do the archaeology and the anthropology in ways that only the public knows about Indiana Jones. We have some pretty incredible things. We have amazing stories to tell, unrivaled collection, and expert research. So we have all the stuff to make some really great exhibitions. And we had been doing some great exhibitions through the course of our history. But again, they had been somewhat focused more internally than externally. So when I started um, at my tenureship at the museum, I did start to build my, my team. I had a team of three, including myself when I started, and eventually expanded out to 10. And what we were trying to do through the course of uh, the, the initial exhibitions was just to start testing, really, and to get a sense as to what we could interject into exhibitions that weren't typically present. Could I leave a comment book in the first exhibition that I did? Could I? No. Did I? Yes. And so we had a comment book that was out there, and you would have thought that the world was going to end because there was a comment book in the galleries. What ended up happening through the course of the five months the exhibition was up is that there were 10 comment books that were completely jam-packed with visitors telling us what they thought of the museum, good and bad, what experiences they wanted to have, exhibitions they wanted to see, what they thought of our research, and of course the wonderful Joni Loves Chachi and so-and-so was here. But we got a lot of really good data that was coming forth from that that we used to then start building into the next exhibition. So we, and we would expand. So maybe the comment books are breaking out of the book format, and we're doing something in the galleries where we're asking you to leave us a note, tell us a bit more. And maybe they go up onto a wall. And when we started to put things on the walls in different exhibitions, we started to see conversations happening. And this is all extremely tactile. This is very, very low end, low budget. Um, still don't have the budgets to, to work forward. But my justification for including these kinds of interactive opportunities and really different interpretive strategies in the context of our institution started here, and it was just about simple comments and getting the visitors invested in what it is that we were trying to do. What else do you want to know? How can we tell you? What do you think of the healthcare, um, of healthcare in the United States today? And they, they responded. We have a very educated audience, as most museums do, and they wanted to tell their story, and they wanted it to be grounded and founded within the context of our research and our collections. So we would build, and we had a lot of tactile, a lot of paper, a lot of, you know, want to help, what can you do, do you want to see more? 
And then we started to branch out a bit more into multimedia range, and that would start with just simple videos. And that was something that was not dangerous or scary for people. It was a video, and usually from an expedition or some kind of research-based something. Um, and then for what we did with this was taking, this is taking our comment cards a bit further, and we had an active blog and an exhibition. This failed miserably, but it was something that we had to try. Um, we talked to the curators, we talked them into the idea of wanting to be, you know, using the former data. Look, people really want to have conversations with us. They want to leave the galleries and the museum museum and have an opportunity for further discussion. We're actually planting <coughs> seeds here, which is great because your knowledge, your education, your research is being out there for the world and this is fantastic. Let's go digital. Let's do a blog. Let's see if we can do that. Um, and they were all excited about it. This is going to be wonderful. And then they just didn't have time in the end. And so the blog started to fall into nothingness and people were getting very frustrated with us because we weren't responding to the questions that were coming up. So lesson learned, if we want to do that, we need to find a way to really you know, better facilitate the, the, the conversation online. But we did it, and we moved forward, and we had data, and we're collecting data at every, every angle that we can. How many comment books do we have? How many comment cards do we collect? Let's compile this data into something that will help us grow into the next exhibition. Simple videos, we did an exhibition on 9-11 um, from an archaeological standpoint, and within that context, it seemed um, important for us to show video, and so we had video incorporated within that exhibition. For our institution, it was a little bit more jarring than not, but one that actually uh, visitors responded extremely, extremely well to. We still do tactile, tactile interactives, um, just drawing on, this is a magna doodle that you can get at Toys R Us or any toy store, and we were using it as an opportunity to explain to visitors um, how when archaeologists find sherds in the ground and they have to actually connect the pieces together, this was an opportunity for visitors to try to connect the pieces together. So we showed you where they would have been found in context in the expedition, and then you could connect the dots. We could have gone digital with this. This would be a fantastic digital opportunity, but it was something that we didn't have the funds for, but we still wanted to get the point across. So one of the things that we started to learn is, um, well, and that that we had established within our process is you need to know what your story is. And so we start with story and then we find objects and interpretive opportunities to support the story. As opposed to when I started, it's here's your object list and put it on the wall and we're not going to interpret or ask any other questions of the material or of the research. This is finding a way to create and establish the story first and finding the best material culture and the best opportunities, digital, tactile or otherwise, to support that story. So this interactive, this is for an exhibition called uh, His Golden Touch, the illustrations of Pete Young, and this was something that, again, was sh just showing very simply, archaeologists in the field find shirts. Those shirts have to be recreated, and then you have a better picture of history. We, we decided it, it didn't need to be multimedia. That wasn't anything that we had to do through a multimedia opportunity. Let's just see, and this was our prototype, was to use a magna doodle and see if we could actually just put you know, printouts of each of the shirts and just have you draw them in. And when we tested it, the public who were testing with us liked the idea of holding the pen. They liked the idea of being able to erase it. And they understood the context in the same way they understood how a chalkboard worked. And you can erase your comments and move forward. It seemed to be something that was innate. So, but they were using it. We were getting great you know, feedback from it. And people were really excited about using this very simple multimedia device. So we would take that and take that, dot, that data and that knowledge to the next project. And here's what worked and here's what didn't work for the last projects that we've done. Let's move on to the next one and, and see how we can build from there and what's appropriate for the stories that we're trying to tell as we move forward. This is um, one of the more sophisticated internal multi yeah, multimedia devices that we did. It's a touch screen that just it's a very simply helps you to learn more about, about posters. This one, at this point in time, I didn't need to actually argue quite so much, but it was an opportunity embedded within what was intended to be a very... Um, a very um, artistically focused poster show. It was just going to be posters on the wall and we're not going to talk too much about the specifics of anything. We're going to simple label copy. It's going to be very didactic and that's it. But the posters are propaganda war posters and they're focused on African American people and disservice that was done to them through the course of wartime. That warrants a bit of a different discussion. And this curator actually came in wanting multimedia. He wanted to have a big splash and allow people to dive in. These are images that you're going to see, but it's not going to register unless you're able to actually understand the specific symbology that was being shown in the posters. So I didn't have to convince this curator. He came on board with his understanding that we need to have technology. We need to work, move forward with these kinds of things. We had a, uh, our first blockbuster exhibition, uh, first in one of our two last blockbuster <laughs> exhibitions in 2011. It was called Secrets of the Silk Road, and we had a large budget for that show, larger than I had ever had before. It was, I think, in the end, it was about $2.1 million, so it was a large budget. Um, but again, we're getting its story. So what does this story of the Silk Road need to be? 
We have an amazing collection of material that was coming in from China. It had never left the country. It had traveled uh, to Dutra River Museums before it got to the Penn Museum. It had been in a science museum and an art museum prior to arriving at our institution, which is an archaeology-focused and anthropology-focused institution. So we wanted to shape the story differently. We wanted to rethink how we were telling the story using the same material culture. Um, and so we walked through the story. We created this story, which for our institution was going to be more thematic than chronologically based. But what are the tools that we need to help support the story? And what tools do we need to actually help visitors better understand the Silk Road, about the objects, about the people who were buried there, and what their lives may have been like. And it turned out to be a combination of multimedia and tactile interactives. This was, why was the Silk Road important? And um, what material that you use today was found along the Silk Road? And it's a simple flip panel. You flip the panel up, and it told you the answer to the question. This tested ridiculously high on our, our testing for form, our summative evaluations. The people really were excited about this idea of doing something, which surprised me, because it was so low end. It was so low cost. It was sophisticated, but it was pretty simple. Um, we had to work, I think, with five different researchers to track down the history of the orange and where it came from and guitars and things that were very, very fun for us to actually dive into, but uh, very simple in the end. We also had uh, diving, in the same exhibitions, we were also diving into um, uh, how things were made and really what, what is a textile, what is a mummy, and how, how are these things created. And this we went a little bit more sophisticated with, but again, fairly simply, we had digital microscopes that were incorporated into the context of of, uh, of the exhibition to allow visitors to test. Um, we had samples that they could test and actually look through a digital microscope and see the fibers of a textile and really dive in to the specifics of what constitutes a textile, what, what are things made of, and, and how different are they 3,000 years ago from what you're wearing today. This, again, tested extremely high, but mainly because people were putting their own clothes and their shoes, and they were stripping in the gallery and putting things underneath these <laughs> microscopes to be able to see and investigate further, which is really the heart of what we're trying to do, get people more interested in the topics that we didn't think they would have been interested to begin with. What's a textile? Who cares, right? But no, they did. They cared a lot once they got into this, and they wanted to learn more, and they were driven. And our website was um, became more popular with areas that were focused on textile use. We were tracking that along the way, which is fascinating. So this was, um, for us, in 2011, a really um, big moment that we had all of this material, and we had a lot of data. Um, but it wasn't completely formalized. And so we wanted to take it a step further, and we created a full it, we were calling it an experiment. This is our experimental gallery. We called it Imagine Africa. And the in sole intent with this gallery was to test what the public wanted to see us do with our collection of African material. We have a collection of 25,000 objects from, um, from the continent of Africa and almost every country with the exception of two. Um, we can tell many stories, tons of them. What do you want to know? How can we help you to come into the museum and see things that are representative of the, what you're interested in? So we created this exhibition to be fully experimental. We spent the first year going out into the communities around the museum and talking to them about what they wanted to know about Africa. How do you imagine it? What is it that you would want to know more about? We have um, really strong African collections. We have very uh, strong school group attendance to our African galleries. And the African galleries had not been updated, still have not been updated since around 19, 1986, I think is the last date. And it really didn't have a very strong focus. Um, there's a lot of great material, but not a strong focus. And so we knew that that gallery wasn't doing what it needed to do to help the public to really connect with Africa and Africa people, African people. Um, so, but, but where we start, how do you, you can't just go up to people, as I found out, and ask them, show them a Kuna mask and say, what do you want to know about this? They say, well, what is it? Oh, OK, so let's step back. Let's, let's take that you know, 360 view of this, and then we'll zoom in tighter and closer. So the entire exhibition is asking questions and then cap, cap, yeah, capturing data. We did interviews with the public five times a year, and we also did timing and tracking surveys where we followed them through the galleries to see, after they had done the interview, where did they go? How long did they stay with each object, each opportunity? And we were intending to track two different, two different threads. What content do you want to know, and how do you want to how do you want it presented to you? So we had eight different pods, and those pods we call them were based on typical themes that you would find in any African gallery that we could support within our collection. It was within the the context that our collection could could tell. We were being pretty transparent with that. African art, religion, um, great kingdoms, 
creating things, rites of passage, health and healing. We did a lot of basic things. And then we just asked people and, ha and ranked them and tried to get a sense from a content standpoint, what is it that you want to know? And how can, we, how can we then provide that in the future when we renovate our galleries? We'll, we'll use that as a footprint, as a roadmap into, into the future for ourselves. So content being first. And the second part was interpretation. How do you want this presented to you? Some of the tables were strictly didactic. Others had interpretive measures incorporated into them. And that went from AV to simple tactile flip books and things of that sort. Every, uh, Kate, pod. I don't want to interrupt, but we need to keep oh, moving. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> okay. Doing my job as a chair. No, that's quite <laughs> all right. So we did a lot of testing, and I'll move into, um, and we changed tables out, and we updated as we, as we saw fit based on feedback from the public. Um, we asked them what they liked best and what they thought didn't work quite so well. What we found through the course of this project, however, was that on average, people spent 23 seconds looking at any one object, and that included reading the label. But if you had anything interpretive next to it, it shot up to three minutes on average, which is remarkable. And so we used that data to move forward into our next exhibition, which was highly interactive. And this is Maya 2012, which we used the data from Imagine Africa to fuel into this project and to really use the opportunity in working with Blue Cadet to um, help the public to understand Maya calendars, um, one of the excavations that we had, and how, uh, how this um, queen was found and what the expedition um, and the excavation looked like and um, how it shapes the rest of the, the exhibition. Um, jumping into now Native American Voices, this is the exhibition that we just completed, which is the most ambitious multimedia project that we've ever done. It is working with 75 Native American advisors. It is about their, their voices, their experiences, and so we wanted to really focus on Native American people, what's important to them, themes that are important to them, with the backdrop of our own collection. So the exhibition um, was five years in the making, so we had a lot of the data and a lot of the previous opportunities and understandings of how people functioned in our museums, what they wanted to see in our museum, and we used this all through the course of the development of Native American Voices, which is, um, well, how do I get it to start? Um, it, we'll just Quick. auto play if you go back. I'm so sorry. There it goes. It's not going on my screen. Um, so this was the most ambitious project that we had done. And again, using all of that data to build up to this moment in the past seven years of just doing little experimentations and testing and data collecting and using that argument to move forward to the next exhibition and the next exhibition until we got to this moment where we have this amazing multimedia experience that is testing well. And what we're finding this in this exhibition is that when people are coming into the exhibition, they're using the multimedia and looking at the objects and we're finding at the high end, they're spending 45 minutes in that gallery where we would typically only get about 20 minutes. So the timing and tracking and the way that we're uh, better understanding what's happening with the multimedia inclusion with our fantastic collections and using our research and having all of these amazing voices come in to help tell the stories, it's shining here and it's showing itself very well. It was a fantastic project to work with Victoria on. And we're moving forward now to use this data to create the next couple exhibitions that we're currently in process. So for us, and uh, finding a way to get our media funded was, was a seven year process process and it was something in which it was all about testing and and really building in small little changes here and there where you could then see the results and take those results with you to the next project I think that's all I have. okay thank you all very much thank you so much and for those of you <laughs> who walked in late that was Kate Quinn the director of exhibitions and public programs at the University of Pennsylvania Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology <laughs> and so now we're going to hear the second part of the um, presentations in conjunction with um, Victoria Jones' uh, projects that Blue Cadet has worked on. And this is Marla Schumacher, the Senior Curator of Education at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Hey, everyone. Um, so I'm going to talk about a project that, uh, that we did last last spring. Um, we have not, as an art museum, um, done lots of technology in our galleries. Um, and yeah, my, and, uh, and we started with an exhibition we had a lot of concerns about, and we wound up with a big success. And I'm a firm believer that our early decision to incorporate technology and to make our funders feel what it would be like if we could do these things, I mean, they're not things like the University of Pennsylvania Museum did with giant towers, but they were a huge step forwards for us. So we were very excited, and our public turned out to be equally excited with us. So um, first I'm going to just mention, we had an exhibition uh, coming. You can see it here. Um, oh, where am I going here? There we go. Um, uh, it was called, Tre oh, you just can't see it. Treasures from Korea. 
There we go. Art and culture. I can't see it with my glasses. Art and culture of the Chosun Dynasty. So raise your hand high if you've heard of the Chosun Dynasty. Oh my God, you guys are great. <laughs> when I did that in Philadelphia, one, one little person raised their hand. At, Oh, there you go, yay! So at AAM, big room, one person raised their hand. So we knew that we had a show, and, I will, and we did some testing to prove it, that nobody knew much about. And we also knew from lots of tests that many of your museums have done that people come to see things they kind of already know a little bit about. So um, basically, it was a very large show. It was a, it was a um, partnership with the National Museum of Korea and the Houston Museum of Fine Arts and the LA County Museum. We sent an enormous, the, our three American institutions sent an enormous exhibition of American art called Art Across America to Korea and they sent an enormous exhibition to us. So um, it was thematic. Our, our curator decided to install it in a thematic. There were titles, there were five themes. Um, um, and I'm just showing you a few, a few works of art I'm not even showing you all the thing. King and his court, chosen society, um, ancestor rituals, and Confucian values. Uh, and um, this was a quite a compelling, enormous 40 foot high Buddhist banner that um, played. Oops, it didn't, it didn't, okay, that, that's all right. The fly ins aren't working, but it, we had to install it in our great stair hall. So there was, um, so, <laughs> so to begin, I should say in Philadelphia, just through quirky circumstances, we've had a very deep relationship with our own Korean community for about 15 years. So we had friends we could bring in to talk to us. And we knew a lot. Um, we knew that not very many people know about Korea. But for our grants, we decided, we were applying for an NEH grant, a lot of money. Um, how could we really quick, down and dirty, sh not just say, we know no one knows anything about Korea. But but do a little informal survey. So we sent out a survey to everybody who works at the art museum. That's about 400 people. Um, and we also sent it to our teacher list, which was about 1,000 people. And we asked a very simple question. I have to actually look here. I'm sorry, because my eyes aren't good enough to see the screen, uh, yeah, which you can't quite see. But very simple. Did you ever study anything about Korea? The first line is, in high school? And the, so in high school, no. And, and you know, we just asked people. and, and um, did you ever study anything about Korea in college? And then the question, the third question for teachers was, is it taught in your schools now? And you can see the change. And then the fourth question was, if it is taught in your schools, to what degree, how, how in depth do you go into it? And um, the, the, the tall column is not at all. And the last column, which is completely zero, the last two columns are in great depth. And we asked the, our staff, if you have kids, do your kids study Korean school? So we sort of asked the same question. So we could show to the NEH that we had a high mountain to climb. We had nobody knew anything about Korea. Then we brought in an outside firm to help us do some focus groups. And um, you could just read the first line, and you'll be so happy. This exhibition will be a difficult sell to typical museum goers. <laughs> I mean, nobody wanted to come see the show, I'll just say. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, they're confused about Korea. Is, are we talking about North Korea or South Korea? Politically, we were not allowed to deal with that in any of our titling because South Korea calls itself the Republic of Korea. So the word was Korea. There were a thousand reasons why this is all going to be really hard to convince people. We spelled Chosun in a funny way because Korea has just invented a new romanization of its languages. We got, anyway, we had a high mountain to climb. And then we spoke to Korean people. And I'll just have you read the red one. There was a strong expression that we should attend, not that we want to attend. So that we brought in a bunch of young Korean people. They just felt guilty, like, I should go. My parents will kill me if I don't go. Well, that was very inspiring to us. And um, then the second one was, in this regard, we, I would just say, once again, we kind of knew all this stuff, but it was important to go ahead and do this so we could have somebody else say it, you know, rather than our in-house team that had worked in, with our community for so long. In this regard, the exhibition must be made to be interesting and relevant to them, not just in terms of the Korean subject matter, but in terms of the experience the show will have to offer them. So that was the direction we went. We had to convince people there would be a different kind of experience. Seeing unfamiliar objects in honestly a typical way we often do things at my museum, though we're changing, and I hope, uh, and, and I'm positive about that. So anyway, we began two years out to say, 
we have to make some immersive experiences. So um, we began to work with Blue Cadet two years before the um, exhibition opened and to say, let us tell you what this exhibition is and let's brainstorm ideas together of the things technology might do best or might bring that we couldn't do any other way. They, they came up with about 12 ideas. We had some of our own and we settled on three things. Um, when we began to apply for our grants, therefore, they had already made visual prototypes. And I just think this was huge for, oh, you can't really see. Anyway, can, you sh can we shut those curtains? Ah, don't worry about it. Oh, um, yeah. That's a big screen we were going to have in the exhibition back there, big 14-foot screen. Um, we always send pictures of the things that are going to be in our, so my takeaway from this was, if you can do it so that, oh, thank you, that's plenty, so that, um, and you put the people in, you can see how big the screen is. We always send pictures on grants, but our 14-foot screen is like this, and our 14-inch thing is like this. They're all the same scale. You know, they're not done to scale. So I think this was, when we showed this, I would say we wound up getting the largest grant the NEH gave this year for their challenge grant, $450,000 for Chairman's Award to support this exhibition, and $350,000 from our local PICO, which is Philadelphia Energy something, Pico Exelon, which is our electric company. Um, and when these slides came on, unlike just the artworks, when these slides came on, they went, ooh. So that's just a takeaway. <laughs> that helped us, I think. When we could say, it'll be like this, something like this. And you could also see that the screen is really quite enormous and very beautiful. Um, these were just, I'm just passing these through. Um, so, um, the other one, the three, we chose to do three things. The second one was there are these books that Koreans are extremely pr proud of called Royal Protocols. They're uniquely Korean. There's thousands of them where the, chose, the Confucian dynasty documented every single thing they did. And these books were both a document, a record, and a model. They served as a record of what happened and a model for others to follow. Books, I'm going to say it, die in exhibitions. I mean, they sit in, they sit in cases vitrines open to a single page. People go, oh look, a book, and on they go. Our curator was so, I mean, just she was so proud of these books. <laughs> it was like, okay, we got to do something with the books. So we didn't do anything radical or that probably you haven't done. We just um, were able to, uh, working with Blue Cadet, um, digitize the, this, this book documents a wedding procession of a king and queen, so that was nice, you know, something we could visitors could identify with. Um, and you could scroll through it, and there were pop-up windows you could call up, and if we have time at the end, uh, you might be able to see. The one thing we did decide to do, with the curator's permission, is animate these. So this one on the top, when, when that pop-up window opened, the little guys marched around, and the little things flopped on the top. We just these tiny little gentle animations. I was really, in, I was really impassioned about I don't want it to be another label if they click on a pop-up window. It can't be more to read. Read, look, walk. Read, look, walk. That's what museums are. You know, it, there had to be something else, some little reward. And these animations, they were really short and they were totally whimsical. So it was really, um, the animator at Blue Cadet, and, you know, they did, they did a great job. And we also, anyway, so more. The third thing was, really quickly, um, we had done a lot of public programs on Korean on Korea and Korea Day, Celebrate Korea, all these things. People, the, the, the Korean alphabet, which is called Hangul, is phonetic. I can write my name with it, Marla. It's just sound-based. So we would always have the person on our staff sit at a table and write people's names in Korean for them. And the line would snake around the balcony. There's something about seeing your name written in another language. And so, with Blue Cadet's help, we built a, they built a digital interactive. I should also say from our director's point of view, this is the most important cultural contribution of this whole dynasty. The king had his scholars invent a language that women and, and non-scholars could write because all the court writing was Chinese. So it was a big deal. Korean, there's a national holiday, November 9th, mark it on your calendar, National Hangul Day in Korea. The whole they take up, they have a whole day of celebration. So anyway, those are the things. Now, um, so the interactives, <laughs> finally, um, the Koreans themselves animated one of the royal protocols. This is actually the same royal protocol. And we were, um, we used this in every presentation we made. And we actually played the whole thing. This is right off of YouTube, which we played it right off of YouTube, so it don't have to be fancy. But um, 
anyway, they just took this little book and they made it enormous, you know, um, it's about seven feet high, the projection that we used, and it's quite, and everybody, even the staff when we showed this went, ooh, you know, the people that worked in the store, the people that manned the desks, you know. So, um, and I think if you watch right here, is this gonna happen? Yeah, it does this little transformation, so. Um, YouTube, you can find it. <laughs> so creating these visual, I really learned something for all future exhibitions, which is I have been on these NEH panels. How many of you serve on these peer review panels? I mean, it's a lot of reading. It's a lot of reading. <laughs> Visuals was my takeaway. It was, I think it was extremely important. We all, you know, we got, we also went out into the community with this, with this presentation, with all these things. We got $450,000 from our community. Um, individual gifts. So we have never done that for any show we've ever done. So anyway, um, and then finally, the, my last takeaway, which um, Kate has dealt with much better than I could, is just we did really try to assess so that we're prepared to go forward and say, yes, we did this. Yes, this was part of why this exhibition worked. Um, we tracked people using them, uh, time spent with the royal protocols, time spent with big screen. Um, you can see the, you know, some people stay, a few people stayed a really long time, eight minutes. Median was a minute, 34 seconds or something. Um, with the Hangul Interactive, it was so popular, we had to put up a second station, and there were lines and crowds, so we couldn't really observe anybody anonymously. Um, 33,000 people wrote their name, their cat's name, their children's name, their grandchildren's name in Hangul. So, um, and we're now, uh, the Delaware Art Museum wants to borrow it, so I'll talk to you about that. <laughs> um, so we just interviewed people while we were standing in line. We got sort of informal data, um, et cetera. Uh, the other informal things we learned at the Philadelphia Museum of Art is having these things in, in the exhibition, it seemed to give people permission to relax a little bit. I think too many of our exhibitions feel like a graduate course in Korean art. There's so much to learn. You don't know anything, and you're like, okay, I'm good for the first couple of rooms, then we're gonna coast, you know? I mean, it just, it relaxed everybody. The animations were whimsical. Everybody was happy with them. You know, it was, it, it seemed to give people permission to relax a little bit. Also, people talked more at the, at the interactives than at other places. It talked with each other and with people they did not know, so it kind of seemed to all, almost loosen up the social thing that you could do. We also had an audio tour, you know, and lots of labels and photographs. Um, so in the end, we went from this, this is, what we, this is what people told us about our exhibition before it happened, to this, which is, the, um, which is just a word cloud from, we do have digital comment books at the end of our exhibitions where people can leave us comments. We had written, we also had comment books that you could write in, so Korean people who didn't speak English could write into the books. And these are the big words, learned, art, understanding, Confucian, Buddhism, West, I mean, um, those, are the, those are the big takeaways. Um, we had the largest attendance at any Asian art show we've ever done. Um, and I can't, you know, we can't say it was the media that did all of it, but I am convinced, having spent my career at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, um, trying to think of all the ways visitors might engage with us, that, that the media made a big difference and our starting way out ahead, lots of visuals, lots of conceptualization, doing that work way out so that when you began to apply for money, you had some sexy stuff to put in your application besides all of the legitimate scholarship and everything else. So those are my takeaways. Um, I, do I have time to, sh it's just a short, Little. We have about yeah, four minutes. Oh God, way less than that. I'm just, um, I thought you might like to see how it actually turned out. <laughs> so th that's actually how the screen, if I, if uh, this, you know, the screen looked. There were two 42 inch touch screens on either side. There was a menu. This screen is called 10 longevity symbols and that's all this interactive does. You can touch the crane, the crane comes up. There's a little animation, the little cranes move around a little bit <laughs> and you can learn why a crane is a symbol for a long life. We went with extremely simple concepts in every case. We didn't want people to get overwhelmed by the media, um, but it was very popular. And then I just press go again. Here's the royal pro, here's someone using the royal pro, there's the book, and there's the way the royal protocol, oh, there's me, that's gonna go by fast, I hope. <laughs> can I click again and it goes, oh. Oh no, this. <laughs> um, here you'll see one of the little animations, I think it comes up. If you touch a hot spot, 
The book begins with the last person in the parade, so we kind of needed to say that. <laughs> and then we created, uh, with Blue Cadet, these little, oh, I think you get to see the little animation. People really like these little, <laughs> you know, it kind of said, oh, let's see if there's another one. And so we were kind of, we were sort of encouraging them to dig deeper, um, et cetera. Okay, and finally, you can see Arthi, who was from our media department, um, our communications department, write her name in Hangul. Uh, one of the one of the things we decided to do was people like this so much. We we planned this out in advance. Is well, you'll see your name gets revealed for you what it looks like, and then you can print it and take it with you. So that was here we go. It shows your handwriting. It shows the et cetera. So that was that was our project, and um, uh, I do think it was a real reason why that show was able to raise so much money. So thank you. Thank you. We need to switch out. Okay, I'll talk. Okay, <laughs> go ahead. Um, so our next presenter is Karen Voss, who's the media producer um, in collection information access at the J. Paul Getty Museum, and um, she has a great uh, bio that she sent me. That then my computer died, so I tried to scribble it down. But uh, she has a background in film school at USC, and she's worked um, with the um, several different institutions and has done pilot multimedia literacy programs. And um, I'm really excited to hear about um, what museums can learn from the digital humanities. Um, and just for anyone who came in late, uh, Chad Weinard is ill, and so he will not be presenting this morning. Most of you have already heard me say this. Um, just want to reiterate that. And so this is going to be our last uh, presentation of the morning. And if you are ready, oh, fantastic. I talked just long enough. Maybe. <laughs> And at the end, we will leave time for questions for both projects. There's a microphone in the middle of the room. We are audio recording all of the sessions at the conference. So we would very much appreciate if you use the microphone for your questions. Thank you. Sorry, it's, um, it's not performing correctly. Oh. Oh, you want presenter view? I want slideshow. Yeah. If you click that. Yeah. Um, look over your shoulder. Oh. <laughs> okay, that was alarming. Um, well, hello everyone. My name is Karen Voss, as you just heard. And I think uh, to preface my talk, it's important for me to say that I have been in a number of different contexts, and it has always seemed to me that we're having kind of adjacent conversations, but we haven't had our big bang moment. And so I'd like to walk you through a couple of these contexts so that um, we can maybe just ferment all of these different kinds of questions. Um, first of all, I started out back at American Film Institute when everyone thought putting short films online would make everyone rich. Um, that didn't happen, of course. Um, and then I went to work for USC, had a pilot program on multimedia literacy, where we were, um, we were tasked with this idea of coming to terms with what is multimedia literacy, how do people perform it? How does it extend scholarship? And, and what, basically, what, what does it mean for higher education? So we were immediately kind of thrust in this idea of a confluence of goals. You know, the idea was to keep the academics on task, the papers robust and all of that, but also add this other element to make media projects that extend on the coursework and with the faculty um, their, their own scholarship. So we had to grapple with a confluence of cultures. You know, everyone's, you, everyone was used to kind of, you put pen to paper or finger to keypad, and your result comes out instantaneously. Um, but with the multimedia literacy, no, nothing like that happened. People were kind of lost in the forest, um, and we had to bring them to these different kinds of authoring tools help them settle on one correctly and, um, and get going from there, which had enormous um, hurdles mm -hmm. and tasks. For some, it was kind of like the Wild West. Um, for other, it was a great hall of terrors. Um, so one thing that 
we kind of came to it was who's doing digital humanities and who's doing it right? Um, in academia, we are always uh, our, you know, a, a central energy we we try to get out is is there a canon? <clears throat> what are the milestones of our field? What you know, what things can we show as models to students? At that time, there was pretty much nothing. And even now, if you're just going to do some searches, you can come up with some interesting lists. But this one goes on for like 10 pages. And, you know, to kind of search through all of those links would be somewhat daunting. And I don't know if you all feel that there's been a consensus in our profession as to what the best projects are. Or if you were going to teach a course on what you do, how, how would you point to things that evidence this kind of literacy? And this all has all to do with scoping of projects. Um, and another thing, is there a canon? <coughs> can we conceive of one? Um, again, you can find lots of lists of people um, talking about digital humanities, but there's no really way to see all the digital humanities projects as a group and to appreciate what, you know, to get some collective wisdom. Um, when we were coming up with multimedia literacy, um, we made we made our own list, but you know, it became clear that there's a there's a need for critical thinking and empowerment um, and an ability to read and write with media um, that includes, of course, visual, oral, informational, graphical, digital, and media forms, and it forced people to build a conceptual core. This became one of the touchstones of the whole program um, because it's like you might have an idea. You might even have some scholarship that you've been working on. But now, how are you going to get that information into a concept that links your graphical video elements, something that couldn't exist on paper alone? So something that pushes you into the realm of media, but is not, um, but is not just text on a screen. And I think in a lot of ways, a lot of us still think of, you know, hyperlinking as kind of one of our main structural go-tos. Um, anyway, so we plotted all this down and told the students uh, they had to fit it into one semester. So I'm coming back to this idea of scope. And I'd like to walk along some different projects to show you what, what some of our kids could do, what uh, a digital humanities um, higher faculty scholarship um, project, and then segueing into the, some of the stuff we do at the Getty. So this was a project that was done in the early 2000s, and this was one student who decided she was in an archaeology class, and she wanted to build or reconstruct the Baths of Caracalla. This was absolutely something that would be very hard to ingest in words alone, <laughs> but became a platform for her to, to make graphical representations. <coughs> So she did um, various centuries, and she had animations where she could cast light against the way the architecture was with interactive maps. And she kept a design journal the whole way. Um, a lot of times I wish that we had access to other museums' kind of design journals and their processes. Um, and the thing about this is that it has survived. Another thing that academics think about are genres. Um, when we talk about projects we want to do for museum, are we thinking, do, do we have any classification mode? Do we have a taxonomy of the kinds of things that we've done and the kinds of things we'd like to ask for? Or how we even can reach consensus on the kind of language we want to use? If you say, I want to do an interactive, what does that mean exactly? Um, if you want to use more than one screen and have a more experiential approach, as with that lovely project, um, you know, how do we how do we talk about that in a way that that people can understand? Um, this is a project then that um, we did with um, a, a tight um, team of scholars at USC, and it was um, meant to show the kind of advent of Pasadena's culture of cultivation 
um, its fall into kind of slum-like conditions and its redevelopment. So I will just, I'll just show you a bit of that. All right, so after the introduction, we put together a graphical interface, and this was, um, we worked with the Auto Club of Southern California because they had a trove. Um, they would systematically photograph each block of Los Angeles, you know, uh, on a regular basis. So we were able to get a, a number of images from them, and then we went to those sites today and photographed them in the exact same space. So we could come up with these kind of sliders where you could immediately get a sense of what was there and what's there now. And this, uh, this was very appealing to people. We also had interviews. And this is kind of a, an interface that at the time we were thinking would kind of gravitate people toward you know, wanting to explore it. So this is the state historian of California. He's talking about gardens and the Pasadena dream and so forth. So we had this kind of sexy uh, interface. And this became something that finally the university could recognize as a work of scholarship. Um, today, still, um, people grapple with being able to count it toward their tenure or any kind of career advancement. It's seen as kind of a hobby still. All right, so moving on from there, when I first came to the Getty, that we were mounting our show Overdrive, Los Angeles Constructs the Future. And we had a budget to work with local scholars. Um, and so working closely with them, seeing what they could pull out. And a lot of these projects were based on research that they had. So there's a note, um, you know, maybe there are scholars working <coughs> on exhibition materials that you're contending with that might be able to bring years of research um, to a kind of project like this, where um, it was actually uh, three parts where um, the professor Phil Eppington wanted to show the demographics of the region from both 1977, you know, moving through the years, and this was continually ticking. And you can find it on um, YouTube if you so desire. Um, and then to compare it, 2000. Oops. And then. Again, with the LA freeway system and railroad tracks, and just really looking at how the the um, the territory was was built. We were also able to put together um, Edward Ruscha's book into a multimedia project.
All right, well, moving on. Shoot. Or not. Seems to be stuck. Oh no. Sorry. Is it totally frozen? Then fast forward to um, just last week, we finished this project on serving in the Pulian vase, where we were able to weave together different stories about conserving a vase. And it was particularly, the story is particularly interesting because um, back in the 19th century when the vase fragments were found, the, this expert restorer, Rafael Gargiulo, put it together so perfectly that you couldn't tell what was new and what was the existing original pieces. Mm -hmm. So what we did is we went back and we went through the forensic process that our conservation people went through to determine what was new and what was old and they completely took apart the vase and put it back together. Um, you can actually look at this on our website. Oh dear. Oh, um, switch yeah. networks. <clears throat> so you can access this um, on our website as well but in the gallery, it's on, on an iPad. So we have, a, we have these kind of forensic um, categories, discovery, restoration, forensics, and conservation. <coughs> so I won't go through all of it. Um, But we were able to do things like this, where you can see the ultraviolet photography that allowed them to tell what was different. Um, so I'll just, and then we were also able to include things such as this. Everyone was worried that, um, that when people saw that the base was being taken apart, they would get really bummed. But fortunately, we were able to build it back up. <laughs> All of which is to tell the story that now, conservation ethics um, direct us to you know, separating what was the restoration and what was original. And then finally, we've moved into the world of mobile um, tours. Okay, but to come back around and just kind of sum up um, and say, you know, do we have genres? Do we have a canon? Do we have kind of set methods and scheduling processes that we can all share and benefit from? 
are we all just kind of off in our own little idiosyncratic environments, kind of trying to do, do things that are meaningful for our exhibitions, but have not necessarily infiltrated the, um, the field as a whole. So with those thoughts, I leave you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so let's open it up to questions. Um, and either we need to repeat the questions or you need to use a microphone. You can yell and I'll repeat it for you this time. But everyone else, consider walking up to the microphone. and it's sexy and it's going to be there. But later on, when you want to maintain the project or keep it up with uh, versions of, let's say, new mobile platforms or something like that, then the funding is much harder to, get, to come by because it's just simply maintenance. Is there any strategy that you approach for ongoing maintenance and conservation of the digital projects that you actually so that was a very long question. I'm going to summarize. <laughs> uh, the question is about uh, the funding process and how does one continue to get funding to maintain digital projects after they've been executed alongside an exhibition? <laughs> oh, if I can reach. Oh. Yeah. Um, I would say that for us, when we're um, going after funding for any exhibition project, it's uh, a temporary exhibition first and foremost, and so we build within the context of the, of the run of the exhibition, spares. We build in spares, we build in contingency for maintenance that would cover the run of the show. If it's a traveling show for all the multimedia, we build that in, and it's just projections with typically a 5% increase per year to be able to um, support and maintain that technology as it's on the road and certainly as it's in our own institution. It's typically just the hardware software and you know that we're, we're building into the budget maintenance and uh, we have personnel on staff who are able to maintain it. In other institutions, when things travel, if they don't have that support, that we're also building in travel and necessary um, um, support for those people to go to the institution to be able to update the exhibitions. For permanent galleries, it's a bit more tricky for us. Um, it's something that, um, you know, we have some galleries that had screens that were put in, um, you know, in the 80s and still some that had VCR tapes in them. And so at that moment, it's how core is this piece of video that hasn't been working in, in months to the museum and are we still going to use it? And there's no institutional memory about why the video was there and why it isn't working, then we, we, we have a discussion. Do we take it out? Do we update it? Um, and we're at a point now where we're going to be updating our entire institution. So the, primarily, I guess, I don't know, I think right now we're at like 14,000 square feet of our exhibition space is gonna be updated for permanent galleries. And so we're taking a very sober look at what has existed and why it existed in the past, what its point was, if there was a point for the story that they were trying to tell. It, in most cases though, if the institutional memory isn't there, we've been taking it out simply because we can't afford to maintain it. There doesn't seem to be a reason to include it. And, and it's a case by case basis. Next. Sorry. So as you build your grant and let's say you wanted to go over a 15, 16 year cycle, do you build a sinking fund into your grant to say you'd like to maintain it for that amount of time? Um, we do that for some of our projects. So the question is about putting a funding into the grant um, for main, maintenance over a, a course of time. Um, for us, it depends on the grant. Some of them won't, you can't have maintenance costs built within the parameters of the grant application, but we are not solely funded by grants at our institution, so private funds would go towards maintenance. And so, yes, that is built in with a projection of whatever the run of the show is. And I'd actually, I'd like to have Karen respond to this as well, being that she talked about the canon of the work we do and uh, yeah. in context of how you deal with that at the Getty. Well, we're still going show by show. And again, our institutional history is not where it should be. Um, and that's a whole other conversation about archiving. But I will say that there's a very real challenge in making things that will last um, for any, we, we don't know what the next thing is gonna be. We're building for iPads now like crazy. 
um, when we do our, our mobile tours, um, we have to work out a serious service agreement because they can turn that phone, you know, they can turn that off at any given point in time. So it's, it's something that we need to think about in terms of both how can we get this thing off the ground and have it be wonderful, but then how, what kind of lifespan do we want it to have? So it's, it's kind of an open question, but I know I did also serve on National Endowment of the Humanities grants, and there were um, several things that just got people excluded right off the bat. Um, you know, namely that they were trying to build software where I don't know if we should be in that business. Um, and, um, and also just not scanning the field correctly. Again, this lack of canon. So people presenting ideas that they think have never been done before, which actually have been done before. So, you know, working in these kinds of service agreements are, are quite a challenge. And I think it brings up a good point about documentation, um, that there were some ignites uh, that addressed, um, and that by documenting our work in interactives and documenting the process and why we're doing what we're doing and what the goals are, what the means are that we were working with at that time are so critical for us to start to build that canon. Um, there was another question in the back. Can I convince you to stand up and talk into that microphone? Thank you. <laughs> Greatly appreciate it. Simon Tanner, I'm from the Department of Digital Humanities at King's College London, and I wanted to ask Karen, but also others, uh, a question. Um, but maybe comment briefly, just, just to add some information to what you were saying about, um, from our perspective, there isn't a canon because it's too big. That would be like saying, is there an arts humanities canon? It's, it's, it, our, 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 our projects cover so many areas. Um, we have over five million digital objects in our, in our departments uh, that span 150 projects over the last 15 years and 200 million hits in the last five years. We can't say that anyone, you know, in those areas. Uh, I'd encourage everyone to have a look on Twitter. I've posted about the Alliance for Digital Humanities Organizations, which is a place to go and find partners um, who are self-identifying as digital humanists, because that will be a, a, an interesting area to go to, because this is a big funding area here. I mean, our, my department, uh, we're averaging between two and three million pounds of research income a year from digital humanities. So there is a funding stream there and digital humanities organizations are looking for partners out there in the glam sectors, in the, in the galleries, libraries, archives and museums. What I wanted to do, and I think MCN has been really good about this, over the last four years it's given space to digital, digital humanities in different panels and terms, etc. So the question I want to ask you is not what can museums learn from digital humanities, what do you want from digital humanities? Mm -hmm. And what can digital humanities learn from museums? OK. Well, big questions, to be sure. Um, you know, this might be putting my background in the foreground and just kind of thinking through the different contexts I've worked in. Um, I think that it's important that we develop um, more precise languages of how we talk to each other. And how we look to train the people who are going to come after us. Um, I've had a number of people ask me, how did you get where you got? And I would never, ever recommend my trajectory to anybody. And so the thing is, we have to, or I think it would be very beneficial if we came to some agreements about at least a couple of what we consider the rock stars of our field. So for example, if you had to teach a course in digital humanities that led to maybe thinking about a career in museums, how would you structure that course? What kind of underlying literacies do we have to share? Um, you know, in some ways it's not just a one-on-one -on -one conversation, it's a, it's a tripod because then you throw into the mix an appreciation of high production values. You know, there are always people willing to kind of go off on their own and do things off the self shop uh, software, and that's great. But one of the things is professionalizing someone so that they're not solely doing scholarship, but they're doing it in such a way that it it hits the ground in a more professional way. And so I, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but I'm just throwing three things against the wall because they seem like they go together. Can I 
pronounce that, that, that one. I mean, we're, we're running, a, running a master's program in digital humanities. Okay. Uh, one of the few that exists and it has within that whole areas on, on um, uh, areas of cultural production and uh, uh, creative industries as well as inter integrated with museums. We run a partner program to that called the Masters in uh, Digital Asset and Media Management. And that's where we're finding it easier to bring some of the digital humanities sensibilities into mm -hmm. people who are going out and getting museum careers after they graduate from that. Um, and, and probably about 20% of our graduates are going into to, to, to museum careers in some ways or other after that course. So there's, a, there's, a, there's an aspect here which is, uh, I suppose my, my only word of criticism would be, whenever I come to America, um, it's as if digital humanities exist in nowhere but America. <laughs> but actually the leadership for digital humanities is mainly in Europe hmm. uh, in terms of the real innovation. So I would say, yeah, look overseas because there are some really big things going on there. Um, but the, the other thing here is, is that it seems to me that the, the subject of digital humanities as a scholarly subject uh, is one which is so wide in terms of the, ver the variety of humanities interests that can be engaged with, whether that's from an art history perspective or a scholarly edition perspective or though, you know, various different uh, perspectives. That's, that, that's, you know, we have projects with, with departments of theology, English history, you know, all those, those areas. That there needs to be a, uh, that community conversation happening between the subject areas uh, because it's, it's unlikely that uh, someone will take a digital humanities qualification because they want to go and work in a museum. That might well be where they end up having taken a digital humanities qualification, the same way that medievalists may find themselves in a museum after they work, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And that there's a, there's a need for a revitalization of museum studies, to be honest with you, to take on board more of the digital orientations and more of the, the digital humanities conceptions. Um, but maybe others speakers would like to comment on that side of things as well. May I ask a question of you? May I ask a question of you? Please stay. <laughs> um, so why do people pursue a degree in digital human? I mean, if, if most of them don't come thinking of museum work, what are they thinking of when they, um, why do people pursue a career, a, a, a graduate degree in, in digital humanities? What are the, what are three of the top motivations? That's all I'm just curious about. Uh, it's changing. Uh, five, six years ago, we would have said that most of the people who are coming to do a digital humanities degree, uh, it was part of a transition towards PhD, and it was about getting the skill sets that they wanted to transition from having a history degree to be able to do something in the digital humanities at PhD level. So five, six years ago, I would have said there was a majority that was along those lines. Now I would say that our, 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 our students are, are going into media and publishing. Quite a lot of them are going into uh, into areas around uh, uh, text and publishing and those sorts of areas. There's another growth area which is those people are going into things that relate to big data. So the ability to do data visualizations, information visualizations, being able to manipulate, analyze, uh, and relate, to, relate, to, relate to, to data in those ways. Um, and then uh, another, another group which is going off into, into, the, into the, uh, the sort of memory organizations type, type glam sector type jobs in one way or another. Um, and there's a, a, say a, a still a small proportion who are still then using it as a stepping stone to a higher degree as well. Okay, thanks, just curious. <laughs> Really? <laughs> Come on up. <laughs> I was busy tweeting, thinking the silence would be filled by someone. <coughs> I'm sorry, but in a different tack, but you mentioned it, Karen, to Karen. Um, when you were looking at the Pasadena project, you mentioned that you had this sexy interface and that now this project was sort of being accepted as a scholarly project and had some scholarly weight. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Was it only the interface? Were there other factors? And you mentioned that again in the interface. Yeah, no, the interface was just, and I, I didn't take you through the whole project, but we had a number of sections dealing with Pasadena's, you know, love of gardens to the point that they 
you know, covered bungalows to the kind of architecture and, and thought, you know, going back to the Rose Parade about the ultimate, you know, this is the machine in the garden kind of thing. Um, and so you can dig, drill down into all of those kinds of things. And this actually did go up in the Pasadena Museum of California Art, along with the photography pairs that we had taken. And I just learned that it's going back up. So um, I guess to your question is, um, you know, because one thing we grapple with, with scoping in museum projects, is really trying not to overburden people. And we saw those stats on the two minute visit or, or what have you. So, um, so it really goes to scoping. Um, I think this was seen as more scholarly because it draw on so many sources, both visual and sort of experts holding forth about that kind of thing. But, you know, sadly, um, a lot of my friends who were trying to get that to count as tenure, that's not been recognized at all. Um, I just wanted to know if, you know, for the site-specific kind of installations that you had, was there discussion um, either way, you know, as far as putting that online, put, making it accessible kind of beyond, beyond your walls, um, especially in, with respect to, to grants, you know, was that, was that something that interests the funder or, or was that even, you know, written into it at all? Um, was it explored? For many of our projects, we, we, we typically do explore the option of having uh, some kind of online component. And we're in the process now of reevaluating all of our digital assets for the institution. And um, uh, they've been value engineered out, I would say, in the past as far as um, having components that would be digitally available both online and in the exhibition context. Um, I don't manage the digital assets for the museum that comes from a different department. And so they would make those choices to not include those within their budgets. But again, we're, we're reevaluating it. We have a really strong amount of material online as far as our online, online collections are concerned. I think we've got 600,000 entries at, available online at present. So they're starting to see the potential of having free digital data online with relationship to our expedition, or well, our collections overall, our expeditions and our research. So with that in mind, there is um, a lot more talk about how to formalize, should we formalize digital components for every exhibition that we do. And so it's something that we're exploring in our museum, I don't know if you have. I would, I would say the same thing. Um, these, th these three, we did not. Um, we have been charged with, um, with changing that policy. I think it's gonna be expensive, uh, you know, and I, I'm just gonna say, uh, I'm a lifelong gallery person, and when I hear the, the, on the website them say, well, this could go on the web, but you'd have to change this, I mean, if we don't get people actually showing up to our museums, you know, so I mean, I, I'm, I always am privileging the gallery experience, and then the question is, how much would that have to change for it to also be able to go up on the web? Or can you just make a separate thing that's a second thing? I'm not a tech person, so I don't know, you know, but, um, but th that's where the problem is for me. I'm not, I'm selfish, and I don't want to compromise if I think that the, you know, people are going to be, you know, in a, in a, I don't know the data on what people do on the web and how long they'll stay on a single page. I don't know all that stuff, but I know galleries and I know people are standing and the light is crummy and people are talking around them and there's all this art to see and I better get right to my point and get out. And, you know, I mean, I know that domain and I don't know the other domain. So I don't, we haven't approached outside partners in that regard and that might be, I think that might be a way to go, somebody who really knows that domain and figures out where the tie-ins are and then how much more money does it take to do that. But we, I have certainly been charged by, with pursuing that with my director who's very keen on that. So that's it. <laughs> we have time for one more question if you, anyone's got something burning. No? Okay. Um, Thank you, everyone. Oh, never mind. Stop. Don't clap yet. One more question. Okay. Um, I'm the uh, IT manager for Brit, and so I've been trying to do this cross gap in between like the baby boomers and millennials. And so your um, uh, media for genres 
Um, are you noticing a bigger influx of millennials attacking the digital stuff versus the baby boomers? It's, it's been really very interesting to see. When we first started our data at earlier phases, I guess five to six years ago, we noticed that you know, one of our goals was to pull the students in, that we wanted to have Penn students coming in more and experiencing the galleries and really staying because we knew that they were coming into the museum, but they were bypassing the galleries to go to class, and that's really where their interaction was coming in. If I, if I created something and designed a gallery where they had to walk around an object, they experienced it, but otherwise they were going right past. So we thought multimedia would be a way. If we had any sort of interactivity, maybe that's a way to draw in younger crowds. What we found is that it was the it's always the topic. They're interested in the topic or the thing that they're coming in and they're gonna stay. Didn't matter what we had included with it. So that was kind of disappointing, but it was something that is a fact. And so, all right, great, so we'll work within those contexts. They do play more with the tactile interactives, the youngers, the millennials, um, than they do with the digital. Um, which was also surprising to us. And what we found initially is that the baby boomers were very, very off. They did not want anything to do with the multimedia until it became a bit more sophisticated. And when it became sophisticated and very easy to use, what we found with our Native American Voices Gallery is the millennials bypass the digital, but the baby boomers stay. And they're the ones who are driving up that 45 minute on average visit to that gallery. It's all 55 plus. And it's amazing. They're bringing benches and stools in so they can go from, there's 12 monitors and they say the exact same thing. They show you every object. They go from monitor to monitor all the way around the exhibition because they want to have that connection between screen and object. And so it's really fascinating to see how that's working. And again, for us, what do we do with that now? Now we have that data and how can we move that into the next phase of, of our creation with the caveat that we still want the, the, the millennials to be invested with what we're doing, they're using their phones. So that's really what we see, that when they're coming into the space as far as media is concerned, their connection between object and digital is all on their phones. And so, and it's, it has to be their phone. It's not a phone that we give out. It's not an iPad. It's not an iPod. It's their own phone. And so that's what we're playing with is how and what should we be doing to make that connection. And can we? We know they're using them. We still want to have the authority over what it is that you're learning about within the context of our galleries, but how can we do that best? I know at the Getty, anytime we have an iPad in any of the exhibitions, everyone age 6 to 13 immediately goes up to the iPad and, and is drawn to it, starts playing with it, doing all kinds of things. We even have to build in a process where we jailbreak the iPad so that kids can't get in and gamble or put pictures of themselves up there because they're very um, able to do that. Um, and so we found that interesting, that it's, sometimes it's a device-specific literacy, that you know certain people, okay, that's an iPad, I know I'm supposed to tap and swipe and do all these kinds of things. Whereas my mother, on the other hand, was afraid to touch the computer screen. So you know, you're dealing with a, a broad range of skills. I would say a couple of things in that regard. I think the issue of authority is huge, and it's huge for millennials. They don't want us to tell them stuff. <laughs> They don't want, I mean, in our museum, and we, we do look at millennial, both in our programming, um, they want to drop in, drop out. They would rather listen to a conversation between two other people they don't know. They do want to learn about it. We've interviewed them on, anyway, long story short, we've done a lot of this work. And they would rather go up to you two who were talking over there and just listen in than hear me talk to them. They're, they're, you know, so I think some of the, some of the issues with uh, the digital technology, it's easy for them, they know it, they use it all the time, so it's not necessarily new or cool. Uh, it's what they know how to do, they get the code right away. Um, baby boomers take really good care of your things, that's one nice thing. Oh, they're so careful when they touch it. Of those three interactives that we did, everybody loved the big, giant, 27 foot long, you know, animated video that was life-size of, of that thing, and, and oohed and odd and wrote about it. And you know, we didn't explain anything. We didn't use it as a teachable moment for that. We didn't tell them anything. Over on the side, there was a little label that said who made it, and then what it was. Um, it was meant, you were meant to just have an emotional response to it, and everybody liked that on all levels, kids, adults, you know. A weird thing at our museum, just in terms of museum culture, is when we started building these things, we never once had a conversation about kids. We this was always built for adults, and every single person in the museum would say, oh, the kids are going to love this. And I would say, honestly, we never thought, and I'm a kid person, that's what I do. You know? So that's interesting, that we were perceived as being very childish in doing this, but that's not the way it turned out. The one thing the millennials loved was, was the um, 
write your name in Hangul. They would stay forever. They wrote their boyfriend's name. They wrote each other's names. You know, uh, they did what they wanted to do. We worked. The disappointment for me is there was no learning at all. It was entirely experiential. We worked so hard. We got it down to this just one sentence that told you how important this language was and how it transformed Korea. And it was on the start thing. It was on the, it was on the opening page. Nobody read it. Not one person. Just begin, 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 because they, they saw other people writing their name, and they wanted to do it. So what we did is we made a sign up above on the wall, a big sign that, that had that one sentence. And while you're waiting in line, you could read the sign, because nobody used it. But so there was something about the authenticity, and I'm just going to Compliment Blue Cadet, because I think one, I don't know how they did it, but when you touch the screen, the ink responded to your hand. So if you went slowly, the ink spread. And if you went fast, it didn't spread so much. So you really were having this authentic experience. You were in control. And every time you wrote your name, it was different. And you got to print it out and take it with you. And so gobs and gobs of young people did that, more than, you know, more than delved into the other two. And I think it has a lot to do with authority and being in charge of your own experience. And now it's time for lunch. <laughs>